Uh, welcome back everyone. Hope you had a good lunch. Uh, it's now one o'clock, so we're going to continue um, with this afternoon session. Um, seeing, if it's, seeing as it's a bit longer, um, I'll probably try and stick a couple of breaks in um, where possible. Um, before the break, we were looking at the scheduler um, and we had tried to submit or we had successfully submitted um, a few different jobs and we had done a bit of work to kind of look at the queue and how we could interact with the scheduler and understand um, requesting resources through the SBATCH command. Uh, what we're going to do now is move on from that and look at a few other things, including um, how to cancel a job and some of the other types of commands that you can run um, other than the nest batch. So I will share my screen. So hopefully you're uh, all still logged into Archer. Um, if not, log back in and you'll be able to uh, follow along. So at the moment in my example job, uh, I have a wall time of five seconds. I might uh, increase that to Two minutes, and, and I'm just going to ask for one CPU. I don't need a lot, um, and set the sleep time to to be two minutes. Um, and then wrap that up. Control O, Control X, uh, and then I'm just going to submit my job using the example job script, so sbatch, example-job.sh. And have a quick look at the queue. See that my job is running there. Now let's say you submit a job or you realize you've submitted a job in error or um, you're keeping an eye on results and things aren't what you expect. Um, you might want to end your job early. Um, and the command to do that is s cancel. And you need to give it the job number, which in this case is the job ID here in the SQ. So this will be 2095694. And um, if we now check the queue, we should see that our job is been cancelled and eventually it will be removed. You should still get an output from that job. So you can see I still have an output here, uh, but it will be limited to however far the job got. Um, in this case, it just started to run. We didn't echo any of the additional information that we had in the job script before the sleep command, or sorry, after the sleep command. Um, and we also get a error from the scheduler telling us that we uh, we cancelled the job. Um, if you get into a situation where you need to cancel a large number of jobs, um, S cancel takes a few options, uh, and one of the useful ones is you can simply pass it your username and it will cancel every job that you currently have submitted if that's what you require it to do. Right, um, hopefully that's pretty straightforward. Uh, let's talk about some other types of jobs, um, other than sbatch that is. So there is a command for Slurm called 
um, S run, which gives you the ability to um, launch jobs uh, using um, uh, particular binaries or tools. I can't remember exactly when you use S run instead of S batch, Kevin. Uh, it's um, can be used for more something more like interactive. Yeah, primarily it's used for interactive sessions, um, but uh, the Slam documentation kind of has a lot of information about how you can use SRUN in different names. So you can actually use SRUN, for example, to submit standalone binaries that don't require any particular um, script. So if we um, and actually, what, what SRUN does is it, it returns the output of the job that you've just submitted um, back to the current shell session, um, but it also locks up your current shell. So you can't go away and do um, other things while an SRUN job is running. So in this instance, we're going to use SRUN on the standard partition and in the short queue for just one minute to try and run the command host name. So if I execute this, you'll see that my shell becomes locked up while we wait for the job to run. And I can't use the shell for anything else, but all of the information um, that would have gone to that dot out file is essentially returned to my current shell session. So the reason you might want to do this primarily other than SBatch is because you want um, an interactive session. Uh, and there are some, let's say we want a 10 minute interactive session. Um, the way to do that is to get um, the shell in the session forwarded back to you, which is done using this dash dash PTY flag. Uh, so now what we're asking this job to do essentially is to find us a worker node that fits these resource requests and to return us a bash shell session. So if we run this, the job will go away, the resources will be allocated, and then the shell will be returned to us, but you can see we've left login node, we've actually now used SSH to enter the worker node um, under the, the auspices of the job. Now you can't actually SSH to this node directly. Um, the system doesn't allow that. So you have to gain access to nodes if you need to do it interactively, perhaps for debugging or other types of purposes, you can do it this way. Um, and we can see where we are, we've got host name, um, and uh, what else can we do? Uh, we can have a look at this info, maybe one of this info. Um, in proc, for example, see resources on this particular node. And you can run other jobs um, as you, as you uh, wish now within the, the bounds of the resources that you requested for the interactive session. Uh, so hopefully that was clear. Um, are there any sort of questions about uh, interactive sessions or SRUN? Remember that the main difference between SRUN and SBatch is that SRUN will um, return you, um, sorry, SBatch will allow you to continue working with the shell. So the, the jobs are basically submitted to the queue and then the output is redirected to those dot out files, uh, whereas SRUN uh, essentially blocks any further commands on your on your shell, but also facilitates the use of like interactive sessions if need be. Um, other places where SRUN might be useful, um, sometimes if you um, need to run a program that requires interactive input. Um, at certain points during the computation, then you could use SRUN, for example, to uh, tell it to do things on the command line because it allows you to um, 
interactively manage that, that running process as well as give it access to the large amount of resources available uh, within the cluster. Cool. All right. Um, in the next section, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about running parallel jobs using MPI. Uh, MPI stands for um, Message Passing Interface, and it is a parallelization library um, that a lot of uh, software uses essentially to manage the um, parallelization of certain tasks. Um, unless you're uh, programming the um, actual uh, interactions between different parts of your code and how you're going to break down your your problem. You probably won't have to know too much about MPI, but you should be aware of it um, and how to use programs that, that make use of, of um, the MPI library and, and, and framework to operate. Um, there are a few um, special commands that are available for running MPI programs. Um, they are MPI run, MPI exec, uh, S run is MPI where, or another one called App run. Um, you can give to these specifications that basically of how many processes you want to run um, in parallel. And you can also specify um, how many parallel processes there should be on a, on a single compute node. So for example, um, if you don't want your problem to be distributed across multiple nodes, then you might say that you want um, uh, to be limited to a single node, but you need multiple tasks um, on a single node. Um, to do this, we're going to look at um, an example which uses uh, a program called Sharpen. And Sharpen's a very simple MPI program that essentially takes as input an image and applies a differential filter to it. This is an example of a problem that you can distribute across multiple um, processes. Essentially, you can break the image up into smaller blocks and those blocks essentially can have the differential operator applied to them before the processed image is combined back together. All right, uh, let's have a look here. I'm just going to clean up this folder to get rid of some of these job outputs. Um, and then we're going to start by opening a new file using nano called sharpen.swarm. I'm sorry, I'm still logged into the node. So as you can see, like some programs are not installed or made available on bash uh, on, the, on the, the shell path on the work nodes. Um, so nano is a good example of that. So just to exit out of this S run session, I can use exit. You can see I get a little bit of feedback saying that I've cancelled the job. Now that I'm back on the login node, uh, I can run this and again. Uh, let's start again with the shebang, bin bash. Then we're going to put in a few directives to Slurm about how to run the job. So we're going to have standard again. Um, we're going to have quality of service uh, at short. The, um, I don't know if we need the reservation. We're going to have the Time as 
five minutes. Um, the number of nodes we want to run on is equal to one. And the number of tasks per node, um, I'm just going to put four, but you know, you can put it any number up to the number of calls on the, on the node itself. Um, and then we have to do two special commands here. So yesterday I talked a little bit um, about this concept called the path. And the path is a, a variable. So if we go echo dollar path, the path is a variable that contains a large number of directories. Here they're all separated by colons. Um, so each one of these is a, a directory. And what the shell does is any directory that's added to this path variable, it will go to look for, um, uh, what will it do? It will go to look for um, executable files within those, those folders. So when you type in um, Python, for example, you'll see that this executable is in um, the user bin directory. And if we look at the path, you can see that uh, user bin is one of those directories where um, the shell is going to. If you're compiling or managing your own software on the cluster, then you'll have to add um, your executable locations to the path so that you can access it um, either just with this kind of command. Otherwise, you'll have to put in the absolute path to the command to get it to run. Um, so I have already compiled um, the Sharpen application, which we're going to use. If we go back to editing our run sharpen.slurm, um, we've just called it .slurm here because that's a nice way of telling us that this is a, a batch file, by the way. Um, and the way that we modify the path, we go export path equals and then the location of where I've put the binary file, which is in the shared part of our project, training project, um, and in the bin folder. Um, and then we have to make sure that the old path is appended to the new path variable. So we're, we're overriding the path variable, but including all of the previous paths that were existing on it. If we didn't do this, then this folder would be the only directory on the path and we would be struggling to find things. And don't worry if you mess this up. Uh, this is a temporary thing, uh, the change that is made within the script and it's limited to the script when it's run. So um, if you do mess this up and you can just either log out, log back in, or change this um, for the next time you run, and the path will be back to the way it should be. I have to add um, another variable. So we're going to export another variable here, which is called fuzzy input. Um, this is just the file that the program Sharpen looks for uh, when we run it. So we need to tell it where that, where that file is. Um, so that it can find it. So now we've got two, we, or we've updated the path variable and we've created a new environment variable called fuzzy input. Um, because we're running this at the same time, um, we don't want to all be accessing fuzzy input um, simultaneously. So to um, facilitate that, what we're going to do is use the copy command to copy our fuzzy input 
to the current location where we're running the program. The fuzzy input or this file called fuzzy PGM is in the um, same location as where we run the program. The program will use uh, fuzzy PGM from the location where we're running it to so the current working directory. And then the final step here is to work out how we're going to run um, Sharpen. And the way to do that is we're going to use srun, so it's just going to print um, back to the shell uh, without creating an output file. Um, we don't want it to use multi-threading. Um, that's uh, a topic for another day. Um, and there's a special um, MPI uh, argument that we need to pass called the distribution, which is done by block. Um, the command that we're going to run then is just sharpen MPI. So this is the MPI uh, version of sharpen. I write that out, exit, chmod, in plus x, and sharpen dot slam. Uh, and then let's see if we wrote it all correctly. This true. Oh, I spelled that. I'm sorry. Distribution. Okay. Let's see if that fixes things. Please specify partition name. It's because this is oh sorry, it's because this is S batch, right? So the way we run this now is S batch and sharpen dot slam. So the job is submitted. already finished. Just have a quick look at what's in that file. Right, so the job was run on four processes. The input was 564 by 770 pixels. Uh, the filter size we used was 17 by 17 pixels. This is all set by the, the program and the input. Um, it told us which node that it ran on. And then it gives us some information here about the calculation times. So the calculation time was um, 0.9 of a second. The runtime, which included input and output and setup, was a bit over one second. And we can see the different cores that it ran on, on that node. Right, um, there's some exercises now. Um, if you've been following along, um, the first one just asks you to modify the Sharpen script to run on 128 cores um, on one node. Uh, and then the second exercise here asks you to run it on two nodes um, and 16 processes. So, but to only have eight tasks on each of the two nodes. Um, and then we'll just check the, the output from each of these so that we understand how the job is, is being distributed. Um, so I'll give you, it shouldn't take too long, I'll give you uh, five minutes just quickly to do that. Um, and then we'll come back uh, and do them together before moving on to the, the next section. Um, if you have any troubles or questions, just again, drop them in the chat and uh, we'll do our best to answer them.
Okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to run through the exercises. Um, I just wanted to step back for a second um, because the the use of SRUN here often confuses people and uh, actually confuses me every time I look at it. Um, but essentially, SLAM unfortunately uses SRUN um, in multiple scenarios, including the management of um, MPI processes. Um, what this looks like to me at first glance is that essentially we're launching um, another task to the scheduler um, from within the sbatch S -batch script. Um, but that's not actually the case. When you use srun inside an sbatch script like this, it's used as a way to communicate the requirements of the sbatch task to the MPI um, framework. So if you end up in a situation where the Sloan scheduler gives you um, a few nodes and a few um, CPU cores on which to work with, the location of those nodes and cores that you've been allocated need to be communicated to your MPI program. And that's done through the use of SRUN here. Um, again, it's a little bit unfortunate that they don't have like a special um, executable here or a name that they use um, to manage this. But know that we're not trying to um, talk to the scheduler again when we use SRUN inside an SBATCH script. What we're doing is using SRUN to communicate with the parent uh, task that we've um, submitted to the scheduler so that our program ends up running in, in the right locations on the, on the, um, the cluster. Okay. Uh, let's have a look at these uh, problems. So the first one here is modify the Sharpen script to run on 128 cores on a single node. Okay, so hopefully that's relatively straightforward for everyone. We're going to edit our run sharpen .slurm script and we want the number of tasks per node to be 128 and we're only going to use one node. So if we write that out and exit and then Run the job. Let's see if our job is finished. So be SQ. Awaiting. Starting. So ST here is. Oh no, sorry, that's uh, status. So the job's finished. Okay. The output our job, which was 780. And here we can see uh, all the calls, all the outputs of all the calls that this program was run on, so 128 processes. Uh, the second part of this set of exercises was to uh, configure it to run on two nodes and 16 processes, but with only eight tasks on two nodes. So again, um, we need to go back in and edit our SBATCH scripts. Uh, we're going to tell it to run on two nodes and then the tasks per node, so eight per node was what we requested for 16 in total. We can write that out. Submit our job. Check the queue. It's currently running. Um, and you can see here now I've got a slightly different output in the node list on our queue, showing that we're on two adjacent nodes, 3074 and 3075. 
So when we have a look at our job output, a three, we can see that our job was split um, across those two nodes. So there's a few on seven five and a few on seven four, which is good. Um, all right, so that's pretty much the scheduler. Um, hopefully that uh, has cleared up a few things or at least opened the door to um, the world of how schedulers work and how you can interact with them. Um, you will become more familiar with the scheduler and the options that you can pass um, as you start to submit your own jobs and you'll begin to get a feeling for what is important um, for your particular workload. Um, when you interact with the, the worker nodes or the cluster and you want to do significant amounts of compute, it should always be done through the scheduler. This guarantees that everyone has equitable access to the resources and it also means that your um, usage and so forth is monitored and within the bounds of, of your project. <laughs> Um, an SBatch script is just a shell script with a few extra comment options at the top. Um, and this allows you to essentially direct uh, the Slurm scheduler on, on how to use resources. Um, generally, if you're in doubt about what you're going to do or how much resources you need, you can request a bit more. Um, but a good suggestion is to start small and slowly build up the complexity or size of your problems until you're comfortable um, with what you're doing. Uh, we've got a question that's come through from Alex. Uh, why would we want to use eight processes on two nodes as opposed to 16 on one? So uh, good question and it generally comes down to the type of problem that you're trying to solve. Um, like anything um, in the HPC world, the way your algorithms and your uh, programs decompose the problems that they work on uh, will probably determine the most efficient way to run the, uh, the software on the cluster. Um, to give you an example, um, <laughs> if you have embarrassingly parallel um, processes, uh, processes that don't need to talk to each other, that it doesn't actually matter where you run them and you can run them on, you know, n, uh, any number of, of nodes as long as the number of nodes or the nodes that you're running things on have sufficient memory for you to do your job. Um, in other cases, um, Think about a computational fluid dynamic problem, which is essentially uh, a discretization of uh, time and space. So you have three dimensions where your problem is broken up into cells and the way the equations are solved is to solve um, discretized versions of the, of the partial differential equations between each adjacent cell. Um, in those instances, if you had to break up your problem so that each cell was on a different node, then your MPI, uh, sorry, then your MPI processes would have to um, communicate with every other node that had an adjacent cell. So in those instances, what it's better to do is if you can fit it all into one single memory unit, great, um, that will speed things up because you'll reduce the amount of MPI communication required. Remember that uh, communication between processes on a node is much faster than communication between processes between nodes because the quality of the interconnects um, uh, is not as good. Um, so if you spread your um, work across too many nodes, then you're going to have to do a lot of node-to-node -node communication, which will 
sol uh, slow down the whole solving of, of the problem, as it were. So um, sort of in summary, um, the way you divide or spread your workload across the cluster and the um, type of resources and the style of the resources that you request will strongly depend upon the type of problems that you're trying to solve and um, the most efficient way essentially to, to solve them. Uh, just um, a final note there, sometimes you might find that if the communication between nodes is too much, um, particularly for problems like CFD problems or other um, uh, simulations that rely on like, large discretizations of a, of a spatial domain and, and, and time stepping. You may find that spreading your project or your, your simulation across too many nodes, um, even though you have more cores in total, um, is actually slower than uh, just keeping the whole simulation on a, on a single node. Now that might might not be possible if if the simulation that you're running requires more memory than you can accommodate on a single node. Um, but if it doesn't, then it's probably worth waiting for uh, uh, a single node to become available that you can then monopolize for your for your problem. Hopefully uh, that answers your question, Alex. Okay, we've, uh, we've already stopped for lunch, um, but we've been going now for 42 minutes. So I might just stop for a quick uh, eight, eight minute break, take us to 10.2. Um, so if you want a bit, quick comfort break um, and then come back and we will continue with the next session, which is um, accessing software via modules. All right, hopefully uh, you're all back and um, ready for the next section. Um, we'll try to get through this section hopefully in the next um, hour and uh, then we'll have another quick break before the final section um, this afternoon. Um, this section is about uh, accessing software via modules. Um, so software that is pre-installed on the um, HPC system that you're using. And most HPC systems will use some kind of model that follows this process. Um, and the reason we have modules is that the HPC system is a multi-user environment and all of the users have different requirements for what they might want. So, uh, user A might want to use Python 2, for example, and user B might want to use Python 3, and um, they don't always work well together when they're installed side by side. Um, and the same is true for many of the other key libraries um, that users might want to make use of or share when they're compiling special software or using um, specific tools that have very um, unique dependencies. Now, um, there are uh, um, also, sorry, lost my train of thought for a second there. The other reason um, that you might want to um, use modules is that on specialist systems, um, and Archer 2 is one of those, um, there will be libraries that are compiled with options that are specifically optimized for the processes that um, the system has. 
Um, so what does that mean? Uh, well, often um, there are options associated with some of the very fundamental libraries that are used to solve our computational problems. Um, and those options relate to things like the uh, size of instructions or um, the way in which instructions are used or um, the particular type of instructions that are given to a CPU, for example, to solve the problem. Some CPUs have um, special uh, sort of instruction sets that allow them to solve very specific problems um, very efficiently. Um, so if you dispatch those problems to the general solver, then you can slow down um, the pace at which people can, can run their code significantly. So there's all of these kind of considerations that, that need to be taken into account um, when you uh, compile and use libraries on a particular system. Most of those considerations are taken care of you, uh, taken care of for you by the, the system administrators. Um, and the result of that work is that these packages are made available to you um, via what we call modules. Now, um, environment modules um, are essentially self-contained um, descriptions of everything that needs to exist on your path for you to use a particular version of software. Um, so in other words, when you load modules or when you have modules available in your, your current shell, the module software has a set of instructions that tells it how to modify your environment variables so that the software that you want is available to you um, from your current instance of the shell. Um, the package that Archer uses um, to manage its modules is just simply called module. And you can see um, a list of available modules on Archer by using the module avail command. Uh, what this does is it goes away. Um, there is a, a database or a folder of files that contains all of these configuration options. Um, and it comes back and shows you the different libraries and packages that have been uh, pre-compiled and made available. You can see there's quite a few different ones here. Um, HTF5 is a common uh, parallel file storage um, um, uh, library for tabular data. Um, we've got uh, Trillinos and SuperLU, which are used for solving um, linear equations, I think. Uh, and also we can see that we've got different versions of software. So VASP, for example, which is one of the biggest libraries used on Archer, um, has versions five and six, and then also uh, sub-versions of each of those, so like 6.2.1, for example. Uh, the D here, refers to the default version that will be loaded if you don't specify a version to load. So if you just load VASP without specifying a version number, then you will get version 5.4.4, PL2, uh, without this uh, VTST option. Um, if you need to know more details about the versions or what they mean, then you'll have to speak to your system administrator or your query desk um, to find out the specifics of what's being done. The other nice thing about modules is that sometimes libraries have um, dependencies. So uh, often we build up um, from simple building blocks like uh, BLAST or super, or super LU, and then we'll um, compile another library on top of that that depends on those libraries and so we need to build those relationships into um, the module management. Um, and the system administrator, again, will be doing that for you. So when you load the library that you want, 
it will also bring in all the dependent libraries um, that it has. Sometimes you can uh, get away with using different versions if there are not too big a changes, but generally it's recommended that you should have um, static versions um, in your dependency tree so that you always know that the compilation you did at the top level um, is referencing the correct libraries um, in its dependency tree. Uh, there's also a few um, other libraries available. So here we've just basically got a, a less um, window open to scroll through all of these modules. So if I scroll down, you can see we've also got some platform specific libraries such as these ones compiled by Cray. So Archer 2 is, um, uh, what was it? Uh, installed by a company or created by a company called Cray, which specializes in building these large scale uh, machines. And they have specialist libraries um, that they have uh, uh, made available for use with this system that are optimized for this, this machine. All right. Um, Cool. Oh, sorry. You'll also see that uh, some libraries have an L next to them. Uh, that means that these libraries are already loaded. So a few libraries are loaded um, by default, um, including, for example, this Cray PE library or this CCE library. You can get a listing of all the libraries that are currently available in the environment you're in at the moment, the current instance, by using the list command, the module list. Um, so in this instance, we can see there's like 12 libraries that have been preloaded for us, um, including uh, CCE, which we saw, PE, um, some MPI, related libraries uh, and the environment set up. So this is sort of the basics required um, to use all the, the tools that, that ETPCC has set up specific to this particular cluster. Um, all right, so how do we, how do we load a library? Um, so uh, NC dump, which is related to the netcdf library um, is a pretty common command. Netcdf is a, a multi-dimensional um, parallel, parallel, yeah, I think it's parallel library used for commonly storing um, essentially uh, multi-dimensional data. Um, often it's used for like weather data or um, you can access, if anyone's used like X-Ray in Python, it's used for um, storing data out of X-Ray. So if we try to see whether NC dump is available, um, you can see that there's currently no NC dump and it's looked everywhere. This is actually the same as the path variable that we saw earlier. Um, we can try to load CDF um, by using the load command and then specifying the library we want. And in this instance, it's the Cray version of NetCDF. And you can find this um, by looking uh, in the module avail option, or there's also um, a command called module spider. So if we put in module spider NetCDF, you can see um, any modules that sort of contain that, that string that CDF. So in this instance, I think we're just going to load the non-parallel version. We won't load this parallel version. So to do that, um, I'm going to run the module load and put in, it's going to get the default version. Happens. Okay, so one of the things about 
the CrayNet CDF library as it depends um, on some other modules. Um, and they're not loaded automatically in this case because um, they require us to specify a version. This is sort of all outlined in the Archer documentation. In fact, the Archer documentation uh, talks about a lot of the modules and gives you a lot of information about how these libraries are compiled. So for example, here you can see a listing of lots of the different libraries or the basic libraries that are available. Um, and if we click on next CDF, we get a little bit of information. Um, it tells us that there's two default versions, the serial version, which we were trying to load, um, and an NPI parallel version. Uh, we do also, it says, have to load the HDF5 library first because NetCDF depends on the HDF5 library. So if we go back to Arch2, first load HDF5, that executes OK. And we can try and load NetCDF. And that executes OK. And we can have a look at what's going on with module list. And you can see that uh, two additional libraries have been loaded. Um, and this is the order actually in which they were loaded as well. So we can see we've got Cray HDF5 and the version number is 1.12, whereas NetCDF is 4.7.4. We started this by trying to access ncdump, which is um, a command that comes with the netcdf library. Let's do a which ncdump. And you can see now that ncdump is available um, within the current path. So this is the netcdf library and the version that have been added to the uh, path variable. And we can also have a look at the path variable with echo dollar path um, to see how the path has been modified. And, then this, and in this instance, you can see that we have propended the location of NetCDF uh, as well as the location of HDF5 forward slash bin to get those uh, executables available to us. We can see um, what other executables are available on those paths. So let's have a look at what's in the netcdf binary folder. Bin here is just short for binary, by the way. Um, and you can see that there are a number of executables um, that have been uh, added to the path by loading the, the NetCDF library. So now we have access um, from our shell to all of these uh, different um, binary tools. Um, if we ever get into a situation where we want to uh, unload a module that we've loaded and we can just use the unload command to reverse um, what we did. Just need to give it the uh, name of the module that we want to unload. That executes okay. We have a look at the path. You can see that this net CDF location has been removed, been filtered out. Um, and if we try to find NC dump again, it's going to tell us that there's no NC dump. Cool. Um, any questions so far on what we've just looked at with modules? 
It's a little bit more to go, um, but happy to capture any um, any questions or comments people might have now. Good. Uh, all right, let's talk a little bit now about um, versioning and how we select a specific version of some software. Uh, if we do a module avail, but then put in the, the module we're interested in, uh, it will return a list of the available versions. Um, that match this this string. So in this instance, we can see that there are two versions of the serial net CDF library, um, and similarly two versions of the parallel or MPI enabled version of the library. Uh, and the default is 4.7.4.3, um, but there's also this 4.7.4.7. This was the one that was loaded when we only specified the name. Uh, but we can load the module by specifying the version as well. So we go module load, and we just need to give it essentially this name uh, with the version on the end. So we're just going to do cray dash net cdf and then the version that we want. Assuming this version is available in the module library. If I run that, everything's okay. Let's echo the path. And you can see here that the version has been added. Actually, you can also have a look at what's in this FCDF folder here. And there should be two folders. There's actually multiple folders. So Looks like there is a newer version as well, although that hasn't officially been added to um, the module supported by Archer 2. I suspect this will probably be added um, at some point in the future. Uh, if you need to, um, there's also an option to swap modules. Um, so let's say we've loaded this specific one and we want to swap it for the default. We can go module swap um, and then we can either just put in that CDF, which will get us the default version, or we could uh, specify version number like so. And it will tell you that um, we have changed from CrayNet CDF 4.7 to 4.3. And again, um, if you want to check that, have a look at the path. You can see up here at 4.747 versus 4.7.3. Um, if you want to go back to the way the system was at the beginning, um, you can use the module Purge command. Not sure if this purges everything. Uh, right. Yeah. So purge purge removes yeah. everything. So this will remove. Uh, if you have a look at your module list, purge will basically get rid of all of this. And if you want to reload these other libraries, you'll either have to log out and log back in or uh, load them manually yourself. Um, I'm not going to do that just now because I don't want to log out and log back in. Um, so that's pretty much um, modules. Uh, does anyone have any questions about modules or um, things they'd like to know about how modules work or what modules are available? Um, maybe a few questions for Kevin. 
how do you decide which modules to make available on Arch 2 and who is responsible for, for managing and updating modules? Oh, well, um, so some um, important system software like the MPI are provided by Cray HPE, so uh, we don't say anything about that. Um, those come for free, if you like. And then there are another set of applications, things like VASP, uh, which users want. So uh, we provide those uh, as part of the service. Um, so there's other, thing, there's other things like tools. You can see there something called Perf Tools Base, which is a uh, Profiler, basically, which again come with a system. Uh, so uh, you know, if something that is uh, wanted is not there, uh, we will consider uh, whether there is enough demand to make it available centrally uh, in one of these modules. Otherwise, users are sort of um, asked to manage their own uh, yeah. software requirements. Yes. You, uh, I mean, users can use the module system to manage their own software, which should be noted if they so wish. So they can sort of write their own module mm -hmm. code. Yeah. Or projects can do it on a project basis. Right. Good to know. Um, so I'm not seeing any other uh, questions here. Um, what I suggest is uh, we take a 10 minute break now um, before we meet the next session. Is the uh, oh, I'm a long way behind here. So it's, oh, sorry, maybe not. How long was this? To, Sorry, we might just quickly go through this um, transferring files with remote computers since we had a break about 20 minutes ago. Um, and then we've got two more sections uh, after another break this afternoon. That's all right. Um, so this is a, a common problem um, with working on remote systems. We have data or code or scripts um, or you know other bits of ancillary information that we need to either get onto the remote system or we need to recover from the remote system so we can store it for analysis or use uh, later. Um, so transferring files um, to and from remote computers is pretty common task that um, we're all going to have to get familiar with if we're working in HPC environments. Um, there's lots of different options available um, to do this. Uh, you can use the command line. Um, you can use uh, some GUI tools that are available um, to different systems. Um, I might Talk. I'll talk a little bit about SCP, um, which is a command line tool for moving stuff um, to and from. And then um, if there's sufficient interest, I might um, demonstrate a GUI program called WinSCP. Uh, otherwise, uh, we can move on after that. So I'll just put up a quick poll, um, which you can answer. Um, when you've seen WinSCP, oh sorry, when you've seen SCP, and uh, see whether there's sufficient interest to, to talk a little bit about WinSCP. Okay, so um, downloading files uh, from the internet, we've already actually done this. Um, there's multiple uh, commands that uh, essentially can achieve the same thing. 
they tend to just use um, wget and you can point this um, at a uh, you know, web address essentially or a network location and it will download the file to your current address. Um, you can also use this uh, command called curl, uh, which is uh, a way of accessing uh, URLs to do the same thing. And in fact, curl has quite a few different options um, that you can explore in your own, your own time um, to look at things. Um, most of the time, you're going to be transferring files to and from the remote system um, and your own computer, so you're not going to be accessing things uh, directly from the internet. Uh, to do that, um, there is the command uh, SCP, and this comes with uh, any kind of SSH installation. In fact, it relies upon the same protocol. Um, so the SCH stands for secure, and then the CP is the same as the CP command that you have um, on your, uh, uh, in the shell um, for copying files. Um, and the way it works, so I'm just going to go to a fresh shell. So I'm back on my um, local computer now. So this is my, my local computer and I'm just in a, a folder called now, but we'll go to my home directory here. And you see I've got a few um, different files here, but I'm just going to um, touch a new file called transfer to archer2.txt. So now I've got a new file that I kind of want to send across. Um, and the way you use SCP is you invoke the command you point it at the file that you want to send, or and then you have to specify the login details and the path where you want to put it. So in this instance, that will be uh, my username uh, at login.archer2.arc.arc, um, and then you put a colon then you specify the path. So the path to my home directory, home to 76 to 76 slash Or I could also just put the tilde here, which should put it on my in my home directory. Um, and I also need to specify the I also have to specify my login key, uh, which is uh, ID. Okay. All right. So when I do this, uh, what can I do that? I have to put this dash i here at the beginning. It doesn't like that I've put this flag after the non-flagged arguments, I think. Okay, so it's going to be the same as when we log in using SSH. I need to put in my ask phrases for the RSA key, and then um, capture to itself. And then I'll get a little bit of information that tells me that the file uh, has been transferred. We can check that by going back to Archer 2. Um, I am going to um, CD to my home directory, clear the screen, do a list. And you can see that that file that um, I created has been pushed across. Let's say um, I want to modify that file, put some text in it, hello 
from Arch 2, save that, go back to my local machine. Uh, this is uh, this shell that's my local shell. And let's say I want to do the transfer in reverse. So now I want to get some data off Archer 2. Well, to do that, you need to do the same thing, but instead of specifying um, the file that you want to get or move as the local file, it needs to be the, on the remote system. So in this instance, I need to put Archer 2 as the remote system, and I can't um, specify a folder as where I want to, what I want to transfer, I need to specify a specific file. So here I'm just going to put the home path and then the uh, directory forward slash and then the file that I want to get and then the location I want to transfer it to is where I can't be in. Do the same thing in reverse. I have to specify. By our passwords again, we're creating a new connection to Arch2. Files transferred, you can see that it is now 8.9 kilobytes, so there was um, a bit more information in that file. You check the contents of the file, we can see that the, the file I created originally has been overwritten with the uh, text that I entered on the Arch2 system. Okay, what if you have a, a large number of files that you want to send? Um, well, there's a few ways you can do that. Uh, you can pass the um, dash R flag to SCP, in which case it will recursively copy um, the contents of a directory uh, to the destination, or um, you can create a table so you can um, zip up or tar your data that you want to transfer and then transfer all the data in a compressed single file, which is probably the preferred way of doing things, particularly if you've got a large number of text outputs or, or text files because they tend to um, exaggerate the size of the data to be transferred and a lot of um, bandwidth can be saved by compressing the data down. Um, there's a nice caution here um, that kind of underlines that statement and that is for a large directory, either when you have a very large number of files um, or uh, you have um, uh, large files themselves, then copying recursively with dash r can uh, take quite a long time to complete. So in that instance, you probably want to um, zip up your, your folder structure and send it as a single unit. The thing is that um, every time a file is transferred, um, data about the exchange has to be sent forwards and backwards between you and the server. So um, doing that just once and then focusing on the on the transfer improves the efficiency of the download. Uh, okay, what's in a forward slash? Well, um, after the colon on the remote machine, um, you always need to uh, specify the absolute path, right? So um, that is that when SCP logs onto a machine, it will like appear in the in the root directory. You often don't have rights to um, write to that location. So the best thing you can either do is write to um, your home directory, or I think can you can you write to the work directory? Fire SCP. SCP. Yes. Uh, yeah. So you can also write to the to the work directory via SCP. 
Um, we had another question. Um, in a normal workflow, should we use SCP in our scripts to transfer data between all right, the work directory and our remote personal machine? Okay, so um, generally I would say that you would finish your scripts and then do the transfer in one step, unless you're going to be doing work over a long period of time. So you may want to um, get preliminary results off Archer 2, for example, if you need to do some plotting or visualization work locally to, to check on um, how your script or your, your, your jobs have performed. Um, people will be transferring data to and from Archer pretty regularly. Um, the only thing I would keep in mind is that if you're transferring really large amounts of data, um, that you should be mindful of, of compressing it uh, first. The other thing I'd say is that um, most people have a lot of input data, I think, rather than output data much of the time. So uh, that tends to only be transferred up to the system once um, and kind of aggregated or um, simplified results and then transferred back. Um, if you're doing CFD work, you might have some large amounts of data generated as you save the state of the model at various time steps so you can kind of do visualizations and stuff. Uh, if you need to visualize that, there's no reason why you can't sort of compress it and bring it back down when you need it. Um, but yeah, you might just sort of do it to um, suit your particular, particular workflow. Uh, is it important to keep clearing up our scratch space? Uh, so it's not scratch in, in, in Archer, it's not actually, uh, work is permanent. Oh, they don't, they don't it's wipe not, So it's permanent. Not a, it's not yeah, so, so, yeah, okay. So uh, work, work doesn't get um, wiped periodically. It'll get wiped at, when the project finishes. So at that point, all of the data that existed with the project will be removed at the same time that the project relinquishes access to to the system. I think there's usually a you know, process in place to make sure that you get everything that you, you want before that happens. Um, the main thing about work is that it's not, not backed up, is it? It's too big. Yeah, it's too, too big to back up. Um, so if you do need stuff backed up, you can transfer it to your home directory, but there are limits on how much you can store there as well. Well, maybe you'd also look to uh, yeah. um, shuffle files or anything. Um, another tool that, yeah, so <laughs> the next section is actually um, about RSYNC. Yeah, so Alex, um, we kind of covered this a little bit earlier, maybe it wasn't clear, but um, if you have input data for your scripts, the work nodes can't actually see home, so the tilde, they can't see that location. It's not mounted, um, which is why when we ran that sbatch script originally, the output file just disappeared because it didn't know how to put it in the home directory. Um, if you have data which is required by your computational process to run, then it needs to end up in the, the work the work area. Um, I want to point out again that um, some of the things that I'm saying are quite specific to Archer um, and the way that uh, other systems are administered um, may be different and you'll need to consult the documentation that supports your um, your cluster or, or the HPC facility that you're using um, to determine what 
the best workflow is for the for the resources that you're accessing. They may even have guides or, or um, processes in place to help you help you do that. Uh, but generally, uh, you should be able to get access to and copy to and from um, the system as you as you need. Um, another tool that um, is popular with um, people who access cluster systems is called rsync. Um, so this is a command essentially that looks at the age of or the, the updated date of files and folders um, between two paths. So you can specify um, a local path and a remote path and it will compare the two and copy files backwards and forwards um, depending on um, their age. So you can ask it to only move files um, to your local machine or to the remote machine or you can ask it to make sure that the files on both machines are all the same and all the most recent. Um, so rsync is um, a useful command line tool that, that you can use to uh, keep your local and remote space um, in sync, essentially. Um, I'm not going to uh, demonstrate rsync because um, I'm going to move on to um, WinSCP just quickly. Um, there are applications like this available um, for all systems. Uh, WinSCP is specific um, to Windows, but essentially it offers um, a GUI-like interface for a GUI-like interface for accessing uh, remote systems using the SCP protocol. Um, let's see if I can blow this up a bit. It's a little bit small. Um, Hopefully that's a little bit better. Um, essentially, this you a local disk on one side, and then you can specify a remote location um, on the right. Um, and the way you connect is hold on a second. Is you start a new session. Um, I've got an Archer 2 session already. I know you can actually see that. Can you? Hold on. So when you start a new session, um, you get a. Sorry, this is a little bit difficult because it creates a pop up that the uh, program I'm using to share content doesn't. Ooh. That's a bit ish. All right. But, cool. So it creates um, a pop up that um, allows you to enter some details for Archer 2. There's instructions on how to do this and um, how to give it your private key. Uh, WinSCP uses another SSH protocol called Puppy, uh, called Putty. Um, so you have to convert your private key to um, a PPK file, but it sort of guides you through the process. Um, but when you do the login here, it's going to do the same thing that SCP did, prompts you for the um, uh, passphrase for the, the key, and then it prompts you for the password for Archer 2 creates an authenticated session, and then um, it takes you to um, the location where you last were on Archer 2. So in this instance, I'm just going to blow this back up again for you guys. 
a little bit fiddly here. So in this instance, um, I was logged into the work location, um, but you can navigate up and down the tree. So here, for example, you can see the, the route. Um, and if I want to open something, then I might put in slash home slash T076 slash T076. OK. So this is our shared project home directory. You can see all your, your users. If I click on mine, then you can see all the work that um, we've been doing over the last couple of days. Uh, if you want to transfer stuff to your local machine, you can either drag and drop, or there is some synchronization facilities in here. For example, I can move this file transfer to archer2.txt into here and just copies it across. So th these types of programs are available. So if you need to um, copy things to and from, feel free to work with just basic SCP. Feel free to work with rsync. Um, if you're more comfortable with uh, something like this, then uh, that's also an option. Um, did anyone, just out of interest, um, if you want to drop in the chat, did anyone in, end up installing Mobrex Term, um, which is uh, another uh, package for Windows, I think, primarily, that allows you to kind of integrate a lot of this functionality. So it includes like a shell for connecting to a remote server. It manages your credentials, um, and you can also do this kind of SCP copy. Um, if you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable with working entirely from the shell, then you might think about checking out um, Mobrex term because uh, that might be a bit more um, familiar and manageable, at least um, while you get um, on your feet. Cool. Okay, so we talked a little bit, um, or I, I briefly mentioned the idea of um, creating archives uh, to essentially compress and zip up all of your data. Um, to create an archive, um, we more or less use the, the tar command. So tar comes with um, a number of compression algorithms built in. Um, and the simplest way to use it is to use this, um, uh, sorry, tar-tf here extracts information. Did it extract information? Yeah, this just lists all the information in a, an archive. Where's the... Oh, just another question. Um, oh, uh, alternatives to WinSCP on Mac. Good question. Uh, quick Google here tells me um, you might be able to use FileZilla. Uh, that's a pretty well known and um, uh, easy to use um, SCP clients. Uh, don't know if my Braxton also works on that. Uh, maybe not. Um, there might also be uh, specific Mac tools that 
that I made available. Uh, okay, here's another one, uh, Cyberduck, maybe. Let's check out what this goes about. Oh yeah, so Cyberduck seems to create um, a network drive essentially that you can access through your um, uh, usual kind of drive names, um, either on Mac or on Windows actually. I haven't tried Cyberduck before, but that could be an interesting one to, to try. Okay. Um, let's play around a little bit uh, with compressing um, some data using um, tape archives or TAR. Uh, so we'll log this, not this one. So we're logged back into uh, Arch2 now, um, and I'm in my, we can use PWD to work out where we are, I'm in my home directory. In here I've got um, a number of files, and I'm going to work with that uh, FastQ um, folder that we created yesterday. The little FastQ contains a number of last few files as well as some scripts that we created to process them. Um, we can create do we not create oh yeah we can um, create an archive of the fast queue folder by using tar and then um, the create, so dash C here is for create, V for verbose, Z is for uh, gun zip compression, um, and F says we're going to create a file essentially. This might be one of those nice commands to put into um, explain, uh, explain shell that we looked at yesterday. Create a file called compress data. Gz, and I'm just going to pass it the fastq folder. So here again, we're creating. We're being verbose about it. We're going to compress it. So this specifies the gun zip compression, um, and this tells it that we're giving it a, um, a folder, I think, or, or a new file, essentially. So if we run that. You can see that it takes a little bit of time because each of these files has to be run through the compression algorithm. Um, and if we list what's available in the, the folder, we can see that um, we created that compressed archive. I had a question. I think I just heard it beep at me. Nope. Uh, all right. Okay. Hold on. Sorry, get distracted, everyone. We can check what's in the file um, that was created by using, or in fact, any tabled archive by using the tar tf options. It is like a table of contents, essentially. Um, and F specifies the, the input file that we're, we're going to look at. In this instance, we can look at um, this data and see what it contains. You can see here that these are all the, the files in that, that particular archive. And this saves us having to decompress it um, to find out what it contains. Um, we can look at the uh, exact size of the archive, either through ls-h, in which case we can see that the archive is 6.3 megabytes. 
Um, or you can also use a command called uh, du sh, which will tell you a little bit of information about the space that that file takes up. Yes. Um, remember, uh, we, we did this yesterday, uh, but just for completeness, um, we can also uh, extract the data using the X flag. Um, and we need to tell it that the file is compressed. It comes up, so we add the, the Z there. And then um, the file is to decompress. And this will unpack the file basically into our, our current location. So if I run that and list, oh, sorry, so it will unpack the, the folder. So that was essentially overwritten. If I, let me demonstrate. Let's copy the compressed data here across to the shared directory. Uh, home folders, if I go here, Rerun that decompression and extraction. We have the, the folder FastQ. Into FastQ, we have the, the files that we compressed. So here we can use um, archiving essentially to bundle up and compress a large number of files, uh, and that allows us to. Um, essentially more easily move them um, backwards and forwards between uh, the remote server and our local machine. Um, you will find that the amount of compression you can achieve on the files that you have um, depends on what type of file they are. Text files are pretty efficient, uh, pretty inefficient and they have a large number of um, sort of empty blocks or, or empty space required to store the file in, a, in a, um, a decompressed form. So when you put those types of files through compression algorithms, you tend to get very good results in terms of the amount of um, space uh, that you can save. If your files are binary files, um, so an example of that might be a NetCDF file or a HDF5 file, um, those binary files um, tend to be much more optimized for the way they store the type of data that they contain. And therefore, when you compress that information, you'll find that you won't get the same kind of reductions um, in disk space usage that you would have with text files or other types of, of data. All right, I am going to stop there for a 10 minute break because um, we still got quite a bit to do before four o'clock. Um, if you have any questions about uh, transferring information to and from the machine um, or to the remote system, let me know. Um, otherwise, I will see you uh, at three o'clock. All right, it's now uh, three o'clock um, and we have about an hour left with each other today. Um, I do not think that we're going to have time to get all the way to um, the end of all the content. There's two sections left for today. Uh, the first one is about using resources efficiently. Um, and effectively, and the second one is about um, uh, 
using the resources in a fair and, and equitable way in the sense that you're accessing the system in the way it was intended. Um, I don't get, I don't think we'll cover um, the second part, but I would encourage you to um, read the content in your own time or um, while we're doing the first set of exercises um, this afternoon, um, I'm going to paste a link to that in the chat. It's called um, Responsibility, so using the, the resources responsibly. Um, obviously, uh, we don't want to break the system for everyone, so there are some good rules of thumb and, and general principles about how to, how to do that. Um, instead, what I want to do is um, work through the uh, users' resources, using uh, resources effectively section, uh, which is a good good thing to do as well. Um, I think it'll be more helpful uh, to most people in terms of understanding how to get the most out of your time on the uh, the resources that you have. All right, so let's share the screen again. Okay, so over the last few days, we've touched on a lot of skills. We've talked about um, how to use the shell, how to navigate um, the directory tree, how to interact with uh, and move and rename and um, delete files. Uh, and then today we've talked a little bit about um, the scheduling system and how that works, the architecture of HPC systems, um, how to submit parallel jobs and, and so forth. This section um, is an introductory section to you know, some basic principles when it comes to benchmarking. Um, the types of jobs that you might be running. Um, and what we're going to do is work through an example that uh, first runs a program um, in a serial mode, that is just with one core on one node. Um, and then we're slowly going to increase the number of cores that we use and see how this affects the efficiency of the problem that we're trying to solve. In general sense, um, we want um, to get the most out of uh, the resources that we use. So let's say that we have um, a typical problem and we um, use one core to, to solve that problem and it takes one minute to complete as it took 60 seconds for one core to solve the problem. In an ideal world, if we use two cores, then the problem would take 30 seconds. That is, two cores would halve the amount of time it took to use uh, to solve the problem with one core. And if we threw four cores at the problem, then we would quarter the amount of time. Right? But the truth is that um, when you split up a problem, when you spread a problem across uh, multiple cores, you introduce um, inherent inefficiencies to the overall process. Um, and the result of that is you don't always get um, a perfect um, speed up of the problem. And uh, this exercise is a nice little um, problem that kind of demonstrates how throwing more cores at a problem doesn't necessarily result in the most efficient computation um, and through benchmarking your own code or your own programs you might be able to find um, the optimum amount of resources to support the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, we're going to do this exercise using the um, sharpen code that we used earlier. Um, you don't need to worry too much about this initial introduction because um, everything you have should be in that um, sharpen.slurm uh, 
uh, batch file that we uh, wrote before lunch. Um, so the first step which I'm going to do with you um, is to run, sorry, is to run the uh, sharpen code in serial. That is to run it with um, just a single core available. Um, to do this, uh, we're going to go back to the work directory where the sharpen over here, my user directory under work. I remember we wrote this um, run sharpen.slurm file. If I go back into that with nano, you can see that we've got a wall time of five minutes. I don't think we'll need any more than that. We're always going to run this on a single node um, for today, or for this particular exercise. And think of the number of tasks per node here as the, the number of CPUs. So this is CPUs, it's the number of cores. Sorry, number of cores. So this is how many cores we want to spread the, the problem across. Um, so to get a baseline, as in how long it takes to solve this problem in serial, uh, we're just going to put a single node um, here as our result. So let's um, write that back out. Exit. Going to do a bit of um, clean up here, remove some of these other outputs that we generated. So we just have a clean slate. Uh, and then I'm going to dispatch the run sharpen.slurm. And we should get some measures of how long it takes to run this uh, file in serial. Now remember, uh, this is going to redirect the output of that script to the dot out file associated with the job we submitted. So in this instance, I can have a look and see how long that took. So here we can see that the calculation time was 3.6 seconds for uh, one core. And um, so one processor, it tells us up here at the top of the file how much we used. And 3.71 seconds was the overall runtime. So there was um, 0.1 of a second of input and output uh, and um, kind of set up and tear down of, of the problem. Uh, you can also get um, some statistics on your job by using another command we haven't seen yet called S account, which is spelled A S A C C T. And um, to check that, you need your job number. So our job number was dash L dash J. And dash J here is for the job. The job number for that last job I just ran was 2096380. Oh, that's a little bit too much information. Why did that give me so much? Oh, no, so sorry. This is minus one. Minus L. I'm just going to get that back a little bit better. So this tells us that the job has completed, uh, what we ran. Again, minus J minus L. Sorry, that's a little bit, it's not really displaying particularly well that, is it? Uh, 
table. Yeah, it's quite a quite a large table. Sorry, I there is a way to filter this down to get just the um, run times, which Kevin is looking into for me at the moment. Um, so the exercise now is we run this code in serial. The overall runtime was, uh, we saw that, and we looked at the log output. Okay. Kevin's going to post something in the chat for us to help us with that large table. We saw the large uh, runtime output was, sorry, the overall runtime was 3.7. And the calculation time was um, 3.6. So ideally, what I'd like you to start doing now is populating um, this table for a number of cores. Um, here, we're just doubling the number of cores each time. Uh, so you put the overall runtime in, which was 3.7, the calculation time, which was 3.6. Um, the I.O. time uh, is the difference between those two, so that's uh, the 0.1 second, 0.11 seconds that we have here. Um, and then uh, the calculation core seconds will be the calculation time multiplied by the number of cores. So this is how many total seconds were spent across all the cores that you you had in doing the calculations. And then once we have this table, um, we can start to do the next step, which is uh, to understand how our um, solution performed. Um, before we do that, Kevin gave us a few details here that will help um, get some more useful information out of S counts. And so we can specify the format, get the job ID, um, get the elapsed time, number of tasks, and the end, end, just the end. So end and state. Does that need to be? All commas, right? Unknown arguments. Oh, yeah, minus one is one here. Sorry. So we had this. I'm going to remove the, the dash L here, which conflicts with the format flag. Okay, so we get um, a little bit of information here. But you don't get. Uh, quite as much detailed information about, you know, like that you get out of the um, STD app. But this could be a useful way, for example, to look at um, how some of your bigger jobs are performing where a few seconds here or there, it uh, doesn't matter. For this exercise, um, I want you to use the, the dot out files and look at these numbers because uh, we'll need the granularity that you get from from these measurements to, to have a look at this problem. Okay, so I'm going to give you um, 10 minutes to run these exercises and populate this table. Um, and uh, I'm not going to do all of them. I uh, will rely a little bit on the solution here. Uh, but um, hopefully you'll see um, some interesting numbers start to pop out in the calculation of core seconds, and we'll go from there. Um, if you get stuck or you have any problems, just drop a message in the chat, um, and uh, I will do what I can to, to help you guys out. I'm sorry, so uh, 10 minutes, which will be 25, 25 past three.
Uh, okay, so it looks like um, most people have managed to finish the exercise. Um, hopefully you also had a look at the question that poses down the bottom here um, after you fill out the table. And that is given the structure of the code. So I know you didn't write the code, but essentially um, the assumption here it's making is you, you should get almost perfect speed up um, the more calls you throw at the, at, at the, at the problem. Um, would you expect the I.O. time to be roughly constant? So I'd be interested to see um, what kind of numbers people got here. And um, did the performance that you got, like, did the calculation time essentially um, increase linearly with the number of calls that you threw at the problem? Um, so in the solution to this example, um, when this problem was originally run, we had a, a situation like this, where the overall runtime um, did reduce, uh, but it kind of flattened out um, after a certain number of calls. Um, it actually went up again um, at one point before reducing again. Um, we also saw in that example that the IO time was uh, not constant, but almost constant um, across all of the problems. Um, when you translated this to um, the calculation call seconds, um, you can see that for the first few steps, uh, as we increase the call, we do get um, sort of similar number of call seconds. So we're getting almost um, linear speed up. Um, but as we increase the number of cores, it tends to degrade the number of core seconds. So this is sort of a, an indication um, that our efficiency um, is degrading as we throw more resources at the problem. What's kind of going on here is that um, there is a cost, a computational cost associated with setting up a problem and distributing it across a large number of calls using uh, MPI. And when your problem is very short, or particularly small, there may be a, a flipping point, um, in this case around 16 cores, where the um, gains that you get from increasing um, the number of cores diminishes relative to the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, did everyone get sort of similar results to this where they saw um, the number of cores uh, kind of degrade the efficiency of the problem? And how many cores do you think um, was most efficient for, for your problem given the, the tests that you ran? You guys can just like um, stick your responses in the chat. That's cool. Okay, so Alex Corrin says two cores. That's cool. Right. Um, So the next step of the uh, exercise is to take um, the results from the table you just created um, and to do some additional analysis using uh, a few metrics that give you a bit more um, of a measure of the performance of the code. Um, 
So in the first column here, we're going to, again, just populate this with our overall runtime. So that's the values that we put in uh, the second column of our table in the previous part of the exercise. Um, then we're going to look at the ideal speed up. So the ideal speed up would mean that we reduce the overall runtime of the serial run. So um, in the case where we ran the problem with one core, an ideal speed up would mean that we divide the serial runtime by the number of cores that we have. So the speed up here should be two times, uh, sorry. Right, so the, uh, how do we do this again? Right, so the, sorry, the ideal speed up should be, um, sorry, the number of cores. So this would be two times as fast, four times as fast, eight times as fast, and so on. Um, the actual speed up is the overall runtime in the serial case divided um, by the number of cores. Is that right? No, sorry, it's the um, overall runtime in the serial case divided by the runtime of the case that you're trying to compare. So if this was four seconds and in the two core case it ran in two seconds, then the actual speed up would be a factor of two, right? So this would be four divided by two is two. Um, and similarly, if this ran in one second and our original serial case ran in four seconds, then the speed up would be a factor of four. So we're comparing the ideal speed up with the actual speed up. And then we have a metric called um, parallel efficiency, uh, which is given by dividing uh, the actual speed up by the ideal speed up. So this tells us how far off um, linear efficiency in terms of the number of cores we threw at the problem we were. Um, and we should see that this is kind of quite a good measure that gives us a bit more insight other than just uh, calculation core seconds, which can be a little bit abstract. So if you could um, add these columns to your table um, and calculate these metrics, and then we'll compare back uh, in, oh, let's say, uh, five minutes' time. Hopefully it doesn't, you put all this in Excel and you can uh, calculate it all very quickly. Uh, all right, everyone, uh, I'm going to call it there and start to run through the exercise. Um, hopefully you manage to uh, at least do some of these rows, but um, let's uh, do a little bit of this together. So I'm going to use the data from the original table. We have the overall runtime for the first five tests. Right, so, so this is the overall runtime um, in seconds. 0.516. Then we were asked to fill in these other three columns here. Ideal speed up actual speed up and parallel efficiency. And we said that the ideal speed up, um, if we threw twice as many cores at the problem, would be two. And if we threw four times as many cores as the pro at the problem, so this is versus the one core serial um, efficiency, it would be four, and so on. So you can see these are just the same as the number of cores. So we want it to be 16 times faster than the serial case um, if we throw 16 times more cores at it. Um, the actual speed up uh, 
is the um, going to be equal to the serial case divided by the overall runtime uh, in the case that we're measuring. Uh, so in this case, I'm just going to reduce the number of decimal points here. We can see that um, the speed up was a little bit less than the ideal. In fact, it was 1.9 times faster um, when we threw two cores at it. And if we just populate that down, remember this is the overall runtime divided by the runtime of the test that we're trying to measure. Um, so the overall runtime of the serial case divided by the runtime of the test we're trying to measure. Um, we see that the actual speed up was uh, 2.9 and we were trying to achieve 4 and so on and so forth down to uh, 16 cores. But we can clearly see that we're um, drifting away pretty quickly um, from the ideal speed up. Uh, the parallel efficiency, therefore, um, is what percentage um, was the actual speed up of the ideal speed up. And we can get that number by just dividing the actual speed up by the ideal speed up. So in this case, uh, for the um, parallel efficiency, of the two core uh, run, we were 94% efficient in the sense that we were running at 94% of the ideal um, parallel efficiency. Um, if we drag that down, actually, I need to, uh, yeah, that's fine. Right. If we drag that down, then we will get um, measures of parallel efficiency for all of the cases. In this case, we can see that it's dropping away significantly um, as we get down to 16 cores. In fact, uh, our efficiency is pretty abysmal um, in the 16 core case. Um, if we go back to the problem and we expand that, we can see that this more or less models what we got in this table. Here you can see, um, for example, in the 16 core case, we were down to 39% efficiency, which was um, what we got here. So what can you say about this? Well, um, it's tough because in this situation, if you wanted to use your resources most efficiently, then what you would say is using one core is indeed the most efficient way to use resources. But that only works if you have many of these problems that you want to solve. Um, if we want to do things quickly, which is also a consideration when we're trying to um, compute results, then you might look, for example, at what kind of efficiency um, uh, drop you're prepared to tolerate to get a particular overall runtime. Now, in this instance, you can see that the, uh, the runtime reduces significantly down to about 16 or 32 cores. And after that, um, it either goes back up or remains constant. So if runtime was your only consideration, you might be prepared to throw 32 cores at the problem, even though your efficiency drops to 25% uh, of the serial case. Uh, but this is something that uh, you need to take away and apply to your own problem. Uh, this is a pretty extreme example where you're seeing big reductions in efficiency. Um, and that, I think, is primarily linked to the size of the problem, which is um, very, very small. And therefore, the overhead associated with parallelizing the problem eats away at, at um, the general efficiency of solving the problem itself. Uh, bigger problems. Um, you probably wouldn't see such a large drop-off in efficiencies. Um, you could also add uh, additional columns in here. For example, you might try to split um, across multiple nodes. So perhaps your base case becomes 
um, 16 calls on one node, and then you have four calls on two nodes, sorry, eight calls on two nodes each, and four calls on four nodes, and you can see what kind of efficiency um, penalty you pay um, in those cases uh, for your particular problem. Um, so a quick note, um, and this applies to Archer as well, um, Archer charges you uh, for a full node. So when you request um, resources, uh, it allocates you a whole node, even if you only use one core on that whole node. Um, and that's just a policy of Archer because they want you to use nodes as efficiently as possible. And that means utilizing or doing work that utilizes all of the cores simultaneously. Um, in other situations, you may have clusters which uh, only charge you or um, allow you to share work with other users on a, on a single node. And in those cases, um, you will uh, essentially only be charged for the cores that you're using. Um, I guess uh, there's a few questions here that we've sort of covered already. Um, they, or the, uh, the author of this documentation has kind of indicated that they would probably be prepared to accept um, four cores as a good number of cores, because the parallel efficiency is around 75%. Um, but you, when you approach your own problems, um, will need to weigh up either the efficiency. So you might be able to get more throughput. You could run a lot of these problems with just four cores. Or if you don't have a lot of problems to run, then time may be the, the key constraint. And then you will just throw as many cores as you think is, is feasible at the problem to get it through in the um, shortest amount of time. Um, there's a few tips that come with this. So know what your priority is, whether you're happy to wait, whether you um, are able to run more jobs simultaneously. Um, try to use your real research application to run these benchmarks. Um, if you can, shorten them so that you can uh, just test maybe like a few iterations of a simulation or um, reduce the size of the problem. So maybe um, reduce the size of the models that you're inputting. Uh, a, and finally, um, try to use this type of benchmarking and there are other benchmarking um, workflows available to understand the way that your application and your software interacts with the um, system that you're using so that you get the most out of it and uh, don't end up wasting those precious um, computation hours that you may need to uh, complete your work on the, the, the current um, project funding that you have. Um, are there any kind of questions then about um, using resources efficiently uh, or effectively? Sorry, this is a um, pretty small toy example, but hopefully it gives you a bit of insight into ways that you can um, analyze and test your own problems to, to understand what you should be doing um, with your own uh, data and models. All right, uh, not any questions coming in. It's now um, 4 p.m., uh, which brings us to the conclusion of this course. Um, sorry we didn't make it all the way to uh, talking about 
using shared resources responsibly, but hopefully you can work through this section in your own time. Um, it's relatively straightforward, I think. Uh, this course has uh, been presented um, as part of the Archer 2 Outreach and Training Program um, using the Archer 2 system. Uh, my name's Tony Hallam and I hope that you have uh, enjoyed and gotten out of this course uh, what you were looking for. Uh, we'll be distributing um, some emails uh, for you to provide feedback. Uh, we always welcome um, constructive feedback um, that helps us improve our courses for the next um, generation or the next group of um, researchers that uh, want to come through and learn how to undertake high performance computing. Um, I uh, thank you all for joining in. Um, it's always difficult doing virtual. Uh, oh, and finally, um, the recordings from the last two days will be made available by YouTube and uh, published to the Arch2 website if you wish to revisit any of this material. Um, to do the exercises, the project code um, will be active for another few weeks. So you're free to log back into Archer 2 and try a few different tests using the examples that we, we applied um, over the last two days. Um, and I wish you all good luck with your projects and uh, hope to see you soon. Oh yeah, uh, big thanks to Kevin for uh, helping out today. <laughs> <laughs>